Good morning, River City. You guys ready to worship? Would you stand with us this morning? We're just going to celebrate the joy of his presence this morning. Father God, we are excited and filled with anticipation as we enter into your presence this morning, God. We invite you in. Jesus, we pray that you would come, that you would fill us, that you would fill this place, Father, and that you would be honored and glorified in our praises this morning. We love you. It's your name we pray. Amen. Joy to the world, the Lord is gone. Let earth receive her King. And lead every heart, preparing room. And heaven and nature sings, and heaven and nature sings, and Joy to the world, joy to the world. The Lord is come. Let earth receive a King, and let every heart prepare His room. And heaven and nature sings, and heaven and nature sings. this time of year. Amen. We're going to read in John chapter 1 together this morning. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. 
He was in the world and the world was made through him and yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Amen. This is the word here in the flesh, living
None like yours that can save. Lord, we make way for you this morning in our hearts. Lord, Spirit, come. Let your Spirit come, Father. We are hungry for more of you. We are thirsty for more of you. Nothing else will satisfy but you, Father. We want more. King of kings and Lord of lords. God of salvation. We want more of you in our lives. Be magnified in this place. Be glorified on our praise, Father. In your name we praise you. Lord of love, you're the one our hearts adore. 
He is the King of Kings. Amen. Amen. He's the Lord of Lords. Amen. So this today, we, we, we were kicking off a new series, Good News, Great Joy. Have you guys experienced the great joy that comes from Jesus? I, I know he wants you to experience that, and so we want to we wanna just share an expression of joy with you today and each week during this series. Um, today's comes from Luke 1, starting in verse 39. It says, In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country, to a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby in her womb leaped for joy. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, the sound of your greeting came to my ears. The baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Can you guys believe that? John, in Elizabeth's womb, without any experience of anyone, only knowing darkness, only knowing, I mean, just what he knew as an infant inside his mother, leaped for joy because of Jesus Christ. Can you believe that? An infant. And Jesus wants you to experience the joy that he brings even more than that. And that's something he wants to bring. So can, let's pray for that right now. Let's pray for this, this moment of joy that Jesus brings. God, we thank you so much um, that you allow us to be with you, to spend forever with you, to send your son, Jesus Christ, to die. Um, God, we thank you for this season. We thank you for this season that you would send him um, to be born as the savior of the world. God, we just ask for a renewed sense of joy, a renewed sense of rejoicing in your presence, Lord. God, we ask right now in the name of Jesus that you would fill this room and us with your Holy Spirit and allow that joy to be evident throughout the world. As we leave these doors, Lord, I pray that you just fill us. Give us joy. Give us gratitude. Give us hope in your name, Lord. You are the King of kings and Lord of lords. We give you all of the glory and honor and power and praise, Jesus. And it's your name we pray. Amen. Let's just give it to him this morning, all the glory, the honor, and the power to your name, Jesus. Let's sing it together. All of the glory and honor and power be unto your name, unto your name. All of the glory and honor and power be unto your name, unto your name. All of the glory and honor and power be unto your name, unto your name. All of the glory and honor and power be unto your name. Yeah. All, All of the glory and honor and power be unto your name, unto your name.
you this morning because you are worthy because of who you are Jesus you are worthy to be praised not because of what you do but because of who you are you are mighty you are powerful you are sovereign you are loving you are kind you are gentle you are just and God sometimes it doesn't seem like all these words can go together in one per being but that's what makes you God. We don't have to understand it, Father. We have faith and we can trust and hope in the fact that you are perfectly everything. Everything that you promised to be, God, everything that we can hope in. We trust in you, Father. We thank you for the gift of your son. And we celebrate you this season, God. Every day, in and out, we have salvation because of you. But especially this season, God, we want to stop and praise you for who you are, for the gift that you are. Jesus, we love you. It's our joy to praise you. And it's your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, it is. It is truly a joy and a privilege to be able to worship together as his body. Amen. And we are glad that you're here to do that with us this morning. If it's your first time, we're especially glad that you chose to be with us this morning. Um, if you'd take just a minute after the service and step right outside of this Welcome Center, we'd love to just know that you're here, um, get you some resources of who we are, how you can connect with us, and we'd just love to get to know you a little bit. Um, we're going to continue in our service, but before we do that, would you take a moment and say good morning to someone? Well, good morning. How are you guys doing? Mm. You ready for some church? Mm. Okay, before I bring it, uh, per Jerry's instructions, uh, let me let you know what the Christmas schedule is going to be, okay? Our schedule, and I think the bulletin has this. I just, someone after first service, so staff, if you're listening, I think we have a discrepancy between this slide that we're about to show and the bulletin. Uh, Christmas schedule is this uh, for 12:23, which is Christmas Eve Eve. That is a Friday night. We're gonna have 7 p.m. and then on the 24th, 4:30 and 6 p.m. Those are the two service times. Okay, so that's the Christmas Eve service times. There will be three opportunities, three different services for you to pick from. Uh, 23rd at 7, 24th at 4:30 and 6. Next day is Christmas morning. Okay, and what we're gonna do for Christmas morning, we are going to send you a devotional. We are gonna encourage you to just because of travel schedules and where people are, we are going to give you a, we're going to stream an online service and we're going to encourage you to worship together as a family and do that. We're going to do the same thing on the 1st, which is January 1st, New Year's, because again, so many people travel, I don't want worship to have to stop and what, what happens is we just feel like so many times a year, if we're, not, if we're not careful, all of our dependence for discipleship can be just on the church gathering. And the church gathering is really important. It's critical. But when it comes to equipping you to disciple your family and to minister together with your family, we want to be able to do that. And that's what, the, what these opportunities do. On Christmas morning, I encourage you, do your family routines, whether you do this before, after you open presents, I encourage you to sit down as a family. And this is going to be a little bit more brief, but it's going to be devotional. It's going to be some Christmas worship and just an opportunity for you guys as a family to be that community. You know, when we gather together on weekends, we are a collection of community groups that gather from all over the city, all over the region, really, and come together in our various services. And so on Christmas morning, we're going to equip you to do that. And then on New Year's, we're going to do the same thing. It'll be a streaming service, and we will be back together on January 8th. So write that down, mark that down. 
Uh, but we want people to take advantage of that because I feel like sometimes family, families don't necessarily know how to worship together. And this will give you an opportunity. We'll equip you with what you need to be able to do that. Okay? So that's the Christmas schedule. Now, one thing before we get into the message, I told you I would share the compassion offering update. As of this morning before first service, we have $64,640 that has come in. Praise the Lord for that. We had 176, 180 people. Yeah, I'm sorry I didn't mean to interrupt. Let's give thanks to the Lord for that. That is something that we are grateful for. We had right around 180 people participate and give, unique givers who gave to that. And I am just really, really grateful for everybody who participated. You know, one of the things that we had looked for, we had set a goal and we obviously didn't reach that goal, but the, the key idea, we really wanted to see 100% particip participation. And I don't think we got that, and I, there's lots of different reasons, but um, one of the things I want to say, I want to thank all of you who participated. My prayer is that the Lord blesses you. For those who were, didn't feel you were able, or whatever the reason, one of the things that I want to see for every single person, I want to see us be able to experience God's provision and blessing when we stretch ourselves, or when we, when we do something that we go, I don't know if I can afford this. But our compassion offering, you know, we give that away. We give that for ministries. We give that to the poor. We give that to our feeding ministry. We give that to our partners internationally. That's the point of this. And I've seen so many people be blessed just by doing what the Lord said and experiencing his blessing in that. And so that's my prayer for every one of us. Uh, for you guys who participate in that, thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. And one of the things I want us all to pray together is that the Lord will multiply this offering. You know, there are a lot of things, a lot of needs that we put on that list. And I just pray the Lord's going to multiply this. And you can continue to give if, that, if, if you want to. The link is still open, so you can give at reallife.org or through our app. Um, but my prayer is that the Lord will multiply this and that we will really be able to do something powerful in a number of these different ministries because um, God's doing crazy things all over our community and all over the world, and we get to be a part of it. And this is one of the ways that we help fund that. So let's just pray. Lord, thank you so much for the investment of so many of your people. And I just pray, Lord, that we would, you really would multiply this, this offering, like loaves and fish. You know, our ministry partner in India, Din Bandu, we want to build a building for them. I just pray that you provide every resource needed to be able to do that, Lord. For our Christian, assistant feeding, Christian assistance feeding ministry, Lord, we want to provide for every need for that ministry. For our vocational training ministry, Lord, that serves so many people and teaches them job skills, I pray that you'll provide for every need. Lord, all the different things, all the different ministries that we want to bless, our school, River City Believers Academy, you've been so good to us and our desire is to share your love and your compassion tangibly, not just with words, but tangibly. And so I pray that you do that. Bless every family, every household, Lord, that participated in this offering. I pray that you multiply that back to them and that their faith would be built. We just thank you and we honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, as you heard today, we are starting a new series for Christmas called Good News, Great Joy. Good News, Great Joy. And this month, we're going to focus on the Advent, uh, the Advent theme of joy. And each service, we're going to look at a different aspect of God's provision to help us experience joy. And it's funny, I think sometimes we have a challenge with this. I, 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 I was really excited about this particular teaching series because I think people need, we need to talk about joy. I think a lot of people struggle with joy. Author and researcher Dr. Brene Brown had some interesting observations about joy. She writes about and talks about something that she calls foreboding joy. And here's what foreboding joy is. Foreboding joy is when you have this incredible joyful moment and then this foreboding thought about, oh, but what's going to happen? For example, at home, you see your child sleeping and you love your child and you're so blessed and so grateful. But then the thought comes, what if something happens? What if they get sick or worse? And it steals your joy. Or maybe you have a joyful moment at work. You receive recognition for a job well done. Maybe you get a promotion for a project, and then you think, what if I can't live up to the expectations? I'll probably lose my job. That's foreboding joy. Joy, but then a foreboding thought of, oh, but what, what if this happens? How about at school? You pass the test with flying colors. You killed it. And then the foreboding thought is, uh, none of that information is going to be on the final, and I'm still going to bomb the test. And, you know, you, you, we laugh. And, oh, who would think that? A lot of us do. A lot of people struggle with joy. It's almost like we're afraid of joy. Really think about it. We're afraid to give ourselves to joy. 
I could lose what makes me joyful. And I want to suggest that that betrays a serious and significant misunderstanding of what joy really is and where joy comes from. If you have your Bibles, why don't you turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, this is one of the most well-recognized and, and off-quoted passages from, from the Christmas story. Right? There's a number of different stories, but this one is one that we often read. And we're going to spend some time throughout this whole month looking at this passage and what it says. In Luke chapter 2, you remember... Uh, we're told that there was a census taken of all the people all around Israel, all through the Roman Empire. And everyone had to return to their hometown. Joseph had to return to Bethlehem with his betrothed Mary. Okay? And then verse 8, we pick this up, and we're, we're told this. There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior's been born to you. He's the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your advent, your incarnation, and what this season reminds us of. I just pray, Lord, that this thing of joy and fear, that you'd help us to sort this out. I pray that we'd hear what your word says, we'd hear the voice of your spirit, and that we would respond with obedience. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The first part of the angel's proclamation is do not be afraid. Now, some people think, well, that was just for the shepherds, because of course they were afraid. An angel just showed up. You know, Who wouldn't be afraid? And I'm sure there's some element of that. But this declaration was not just to the shepherds because he says, I bring you good news of great joy. It's not just the shepherds, but it's for all people. It's for all people. I want to suggest that the do not be afraid is part of the declaration. Good news of great joy. If you think about it, there's an incompatibility with fear and joy. There's like people who want to be joyful, but they're afraid. When you stop and think about it, Fear is one of those things that steals your joy. There's nothing that will steal joy faster than fear. And yet, so many people are afraid, they just literally can't experience it. It says, though, though, fear is like joy repellent. You live with fear, you're always going to struggle with joy. Do not be afraid. The problem is, and this is one of the things I want to I challenge us with, our commitment, we, we almost have like a commitment to fear. Think about it. It's like we're committed to be fearful. Fear is safe. And I, I'm, I'm so sick of hearing about safety. You know, we, we've, this has been something that's been going on for years, but under the pandemic that we just w- all walked through, it was like everybody went through it all at the same time. And everything was about safety. And you got to be safe, got to be safe, got to be safe. And it's like, it's the only responsible thing. Be afraid and be safe. When did sa- be safe become a virtue? When did seeking safety become virtuous? It never has been. But now it's like, no, no, if you're, if you're responsible, you're a safe person. If you're, if you're not afraid... If you're, not, if you're not seeking safety, if you're not afraid, you're not paying attention, and you're not responsible. We look at fear as like, well, that's what all, all reasonable, sensible people walk in all the time. Where did that come from? We look at it, we've, we've, in fact, one of the things that happened through the pandemic, pretty heavy, is fear became synonymous with courtesy and respect. You know, if if you're not afraid and you're not displaying your fear, you're being inconsiderate. And we must always accommodate the lowest common denominator, the most fearful. Everything must be done to make the most fearful person feel comfortable. Where do we get this idea that this is a good thing? Where do we get this idea that fear was good? And yet so many of us live that way. We manage our lives that way. It's like we find comfort in our fear. Our fear is our companion. If, I, if I'm afraid and if I can think about all the things I fear, it's like when I hear news that, that reinforces my fear, I grab onto it. 
And it's like, okay, the, I, my fears are justified, and now I can try to control. And as we start exerting control to kind of keep myself safe. It's like my fear is this weird kind of friend who's going to keep me safe. And the scripture says, do not be afraid. In fact, multiple of the angelic proclamations throughout the Christmas story have this idea of do not be afraid. And I don't think it's just, well, you're afraid because there's an angel here. I think it's like good news, great joy. You're never going to live in joy. You're never going to experience joy if you're stuck being afraid. Flip over in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Now remember who Peter is writing to. He's writing to people who are displaced. They've had to leave Jerusalem because of persecution. And they've gone, most of these are in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, the northern part of Turkey. And these are churches. These are churches that are, have, they have Jews and Gentiles, but the common thing is they are going through persecution. They are suffering through hard times. And Peter is writing to them in the midst of this severe persecution. And what he's telling them is, I know you've experienced persecution, but there's going to be more to come. Listen to how he speaks to them. This is 1 Peter 1. I'm just going to read verses 3 through 9. He's introduced himself. He's done his salutation. Here's who's writing. Here's who I'm writing to. And then he says these words. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you've not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now this is written to a people who have every reason to be afraid. They're not afraid of what might happen. They, it actually has happened. And it might happen again. It's real. Real persecution. Real hardship. And look how he begins talking to them. He begins by restating the good news of great joy. He says it a little differently because he's looking back now at the death and resurrection of Christ. But listen to what he says, verses 3 and 4. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. It's an inheritance kept for you in heaven. He's really restating the good news of great joy. Unto us is born a Savior. It's Christ the Lord. He's telling them, this is reason for joy. And he, I love how he points out this inheritance kept in heaven. In other words, it's secure. It's out of reach of anything in this world. It's out of reach of any persecution. It's out of reach of anything that can steal your joy, anything you might be afraid of. It's out of reach of that because your inheritance is secure in him. And he talks to them in verse 6 about how they rejoice in the midst of trial and suffering. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you've had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. So he talks about God's given gifts in the midst of those trials. The proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus is revealed. And then look at what he says in these last couple of verses. He says, though you've not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him. And listen, and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. You're filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Not with depression, not with anxiety, not with fear, but joy. It's all because of what he said you have in Christ. See, Peter's reminding them of what all first century believers had already discovered and what we need to keep in mind. And here's the main point. Here's what I want you to understand. If you're taking notes, write this down. Here's the point of the message this morning. Freedom from fear is found in the good news of great joy, and his name is Jesus. 
Freedom from fear is found in the good news of great joy, and his name is Jesus. See, the good news of great joy is a person. Here's the good news of great joy. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. He's Christ the Lord. It's a person, Jesus, a Savior. This series that we're going to go through over the next few weeks is going to break down that good news described in the proclamation because there's several key aspects of that, and we're going to look at them. But the first part of the proclamation is about fear. Do not be afraid. And it really is, I find it so interesting because it begins with this idea that we want the fear to give way to joy. See, in him, fear gives way to joy. And that's our assignment today. That's the thing I want us to point out. How is it that in Christ, fear gives way to joy? Because man, we got people living with so much fear. We got people who are terrified and it's keeping them from God's best for them. It's keeping them from the goals and dreams that he's put in their heart. It's keeping them from experiencing the life that he created them for because of fear. And our whole challenge this morning is to say, wait a minute, scripture says, don't be afraid because there's good news of great joy. How can we, through the word of God, have fear be displaced by joy? A couple different ways. Number one, okay? Fear gives way to joy when you're filled with the love of God. Fear gives way to joy when you are filled with the love of God. Listen to how Jesus talks about love and joy. Beginning of John 15, John 15, great passage of scripture, verses nine through 11. As the Father has loved me, so I've loved you, Jesus says. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you'll remain in my love just as I've kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. You want to know the saddest things in the world? That so many people look at followers of Jesus and don't think of them as people of joy. We're supposed to be the joy people. I mean, isn't that true? And yet so often, so many churches you walk into, it's like kind of grim. It's kind of, oh, it's, 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 it's as though, well, we got to be here. We don't like it, but, you know, God will like us better if we do it. Which is like, the opposite of the gospel. No, no, he wants to redeem us, he wants to save us, he wants to fill us, and when he fills us with his love, Jesus says, I want you to remain in Father's love so that my joy will be in you, and so that your joy will be full. Listen to what John, he, he, John wrote that down, Jesus' words in John 15. Listen to what John writes himself in 1 John 4, 15 through 19. He says, if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them, and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, in God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we'll have confidence in the day of judgment. In this world, we're like Jesus. There is no fear in love. Well, let me read that again. That's good. There is no fear in love. No fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. See, I just want to pause. Those two scriptures give us two very powerful effects of God's love in the life of a believer. The first is that they are filled with joy. They're filled with joy. The second is that this love of God drives out fear. See, we shouldn't be the people who are afraid. We should be the people who are filled with joy. And as we said before, those two things are almost incompatible. It's like if you're a fear-filled person, it's really hard to identify yourself as a joy-filled person. And if you're a joy-filled person, you're probably not a fear-filled person. These two things are almost like opposites. One thing we need to understand, if we are followers of Jesus Christ and we are saved, we call ourselves believers, we've accepted Christ, our sins have been forgiven, we are complete and whole in him, we are filled with his spirit. You remember what the fruit of the spirit is? The fruit of the spirit is, the first one, love. And what's the second? Joy, and then peace, patience, kindness, and all the others. See, when we are filled with his love and when we become followers of Jesus Christ, we instantly are filled with his love and one of the things that accompanies that is his joy. We are to be people who are filled with love and joy. See, his love does something. When we are truly experiencing and living in his love, two powerful transformations happen in the life of a believer. The first is you really understand how loved you are and you receive the love that you were created for and made for. This is one of the great tragedies. 
There are people who've studied love. They've read scriptures about love. They've memorized scriptures about love. They can tell you all about love. They've been to more Bible studies. They can tell you more about love than I'll ever be able to tell you about. But they've never experienced it. Because, you know, you can always tell someone who's loved. I've told you before, with little kids, it's real obvious. You can see a little kid, a little kid who's real confident. They just walk in the room and just like, of course people love me because I'm me. That's a kid who's never known anything but love, and you can just see it. And you can also see a kid who maybe has had a different experience. They're tentative. And what's one of the biggest earmarks of them? They're fearful. They're fearful. They're afraid. Adults are the same. I mean, we hide it better, right? We're a little more sophisticated. We can hide it a little bit. But someone who is loved, someone who knows, I have been set free by Jesus Christ. He loved me so much. He paid the penalty for my sins on the cross. He's filled me with the Spirit. I am filled with his love. They know that they are loved by God. Do you know, love, knowing your love, that you are loved, changes you. It changes you. One of the coolest things as a pastor that I've been able to see and experience is watching someone be changed by the love of God. First, directly by his spirit and by his salvation and by the recognition that God loves me. But then by living in community, because I understand what happens. Sometimes we, we have to see God's love with skin on it. And that's what happens in the one another ministries of the church, in our community groups, when we experience love in community. It's like God's love with skin on it. And I've watched people. I remember one young woman years ago who we knew, but I hadn't spent much time with her. Well, she became a part of our lives, and I just remember she was so guarded, so, so much of a wall and a barrier, very much fearful, prideful. But I watched as love began to break down those barriers. I watched as she entered into Christian community, and people just loved her. And I watched her. The first thing you notice is they relax a little bit, right? It's like, oh. And you also notice that people begin to feel safe to talk about those things in their life that maybe they've never talked to anybody about. You know, there's things in every one of our lives that, like, we, we know, hey, because we're not perfect, we're all broken, we're all sinful, but because of Jesus Christ, we're being restored, we're being healed, we're being set free. But a lot of that comes from being able to honestly say, man, I struggle with this. And no, I'm not going to be judged. No, I'm not going to be thrown out. I'm not going to be looked at as some kind of loser. See, we understand all have sinned, right? All have sinned. That means all of us. So without Jesus, we're all losers. When it comes to righteousness, when it comes to righteousness, we are. Our righteousness, Scripture says, like filthy rags. But because of Jesus, we're loved, we're forgiven, and we're set free. That's the gift. So uh, when, when I'm in community experiencing the love of God, I realize I can be myself because like everybody else is just like me. Okay, I, as a pastor, I don't have a right to look down at any, I don't care what sinner, whoever they are, what they do, I don't have a right to look down at them because without Jesus, I'm just like them. But Jesus loved me and set me free and he loves them and he wants to set them free. See, it's a totally different perspective. And when people are loved, they begin to feel safe to talk about some of that stuff. They begin to feel safe to admit some stuff that they kind of need God to bring healing in. And it's powerful. Love is transformative. It changes. The second thing that happens, not only do I experience the love of God, and I begin to feel his love, and that changes me. There's a confidence that comes because I'm loved by the creator of all things. But not only do I feel that, but I'm filled with his love, and I can share that with others. I begin to feel not just his love for me. I begin to feel his love for other people. And that's a game changer. Because you're like, yeah, I don't know so much about that because other people annoy me. I mean, you may never think that, okay? I know you don't, but David Wall, he does, don't you, David? <laughs> yeah, we got this thing, uh, I, I love, yeah, I want God, but uh, all these other people, eh, they kind of annoy me. That's why some people say, I, 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 don't, I want God, but I don't want the church because I... You know, it's like, that's like saying, I want the father, but I don't want the brothers and sisters. It doesn't work, doesn't work that way, right? You want the father, you get the brothers and sisters. That's how, that's how the church is supposed to be. We're family. But what happens, what you notice, when I'm filled with the love of God, I am filled with love, and I begin to share, even if I don't have love for someone, 
Even if I'm in the flesh and I'm not loving them, I can share his love. I see in them someone who God loves passionately and who he gave his life for. And they matter because they matter to him. And all of a sudden, I begin to love other people. And see what just happened? A love loop has been created. God's love in us, shared with one another. They receive love. They open up. They receive God's love. And then they begin to share. And it's like this love loop. And understand, it's all his love. It's his love shared with his body and with the world around us. It's powerful. And it changes us. Do you understand that one of the things that fear does, um, it causes selfishness. Selfishness is a response of fear. And when you're loved, and when you experience love in him, you are free because you know you're okay. You're free to become less selfish and to love other people because love removes the fear. And that's when fear gives way to joy. See, one of the great gifts of God's love is joy. I just want to encourage you. You may be here and you've never accepted Christ as Savior. You, you would say, I've never received his love. I just want to say you can it's actually fairly simple the way the scripture lays it out. See, the, the fact is we are all separated from God because of sin. The wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We've all sinned, and what that means, we've all incurred a death penalty that is just and right because of our sin. Well, Jesus Christ came because of his unbelievable love and gave his life so that justice could be satisfied for all who will repent and who will ask him for forgiveness. Justice can be satisfied in the death of Jesus, so God can be just, but he can also extend grace and mercy to us, and we can be set free. That's the love of the gospel. That's how the good news works. And what's great, not only does he forgive the sins of our past, but he comes into our life and fills us with his spirit. That's where the love, joy, peace all the other fruit of the Spirit, it becomes a part of us. And we begin to grow and become more like Jesus because of his love at work in us. So I just want to say, if you've never accepted Christ, you can today. I'm going to pray a very simple prayer. I just want to take a moment and just pray a simple prayer. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes, and this is between you and God. I'm not going to ask you to come up and do anything or anything like that. I just want you to have the opportunity to receive Jesus. I'm going to pray a simple prayer. There's no magic in the words. You pray it, reword it however you want, but, but you share the ideas that the Scripture has regarding salvation. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for what your word teaches about the gospel. Thank you for your love. You've loved us so much. We rejected you. We've ignored you. And yet you still love us. Thank you. Lord, the scripture says, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Lord, right now I confess my sin. Without you, I am lost. I am lost. My sin, Lord, has hurt me. It's hurt you most of all, and it's hurt other people around me. Please forgive my sin. I thank you that because of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, I can be forgiven and set free, Lord. I need to be saved by you. And so I ask that you forgive my sin. I receive that free gift of salvation that you offered to the repentant. And Lord, not only do I want you to forgive the sins of my past, I want you to come and fill my life right now and become the Lord of my life. I want you to lead me every single day. I want the, my future to be different because of your presence, because of your leadership. Lord, I love you and I thank you. And I'm so grateful. Your word says... If I've prayed this prayer and if I've seriously asked you for forgiveness and been filled with your spirit, I'm a new creation. I'm not the same person. My spirit is alive because of you. I thank you, Jesus. And I receive this in your name. Amen. Amen. See, if you prayed that prayer, maybe for the first time, Scripture says you are a new creation in him. And that's awesome. And, and what I want you to know is this is a beginning, not an end. It's not like, okay, I took care of that, now I move on. No, this is a beginning. You are now a follower of Jesus. If you prayed that prayer... Okay, would you do me a favor? Would you text the word follow to this number, 210-880-2181. 210-880-2181. Would you text that, that word follow? Because we're just going to send you some resources, some kind of, okay, how do I begin to do this? How do I follow Jesus? 
And we're going to send you some resources to help you begin to experience following Jesus. It changed your life. It changed your life. Freedom from fear is found in the good news of great joy. And his name is Jesus. Second thing, fear gives way to joy when your faith is in him and not in circumstances. Fear gives way to joy when your faith is in him, not in circumstances. Romans 15, 13 says this. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. See, what we trust in is a big deal. What we trust in is a big deal. And fear is all based on this idea of trusting in self, trusting in circumstances. See, Romans 15 said, joy, peace, and hope all come through trusting in him. See, faith and fear are two opposite ways of seeing the world, okay? And, and again, that's one of those things we saw through the pandemic because we all saw it at the same time. We were all home, and we all watched it, all right? The lenses of fear. There are some people, when something happens in life, their automatic lens is one of fear. And so they try to start, they try to start controlling. They try to find validation for their fear. They get mad at people who aren't afraid, all kinds of things, because their lens is the lens of fear. The lens of faith is completely opposite. The lens of faith doesn't deny that bad things might happen or that there are bad things happening. It just recognizes, wait a minute, yeah, bad things are real, but so is God, and he's bigger, and he's greater. That's the lens of faith. It's like the lens of faith, you put those on, and all of a sudden you see, okay, there really are hard things happening in the world, but man, look at who God is. Look at how much bigger he is. He's with me. He's real. He's present. And something happens. When you look through lenses of faith, there are, and you can always tell, because people who are looking at the world through lenses of faith, they believe in God, they trust in him. They have two responses when something happens. The first one is they listen for his voice. See, people who don't have faith, they go look, for, they go look and their first look is for all the experts. What do the experts say? What, what, is the, what does man's system say? What does the world say I should do? People of faith, their first question is, wait a minute, what does God say? And through the word, through prayer, through biblical counsel, through community, they seek the word of the Lord. They listen for his voice. And then the second thing is they do what he says. See, if you really are looking with lenses of faith and you see he's real and he says, I want you to take this step, and it's like the exact opposite of what the world is telling you to do. But there's God and you see him. Yeah, but this book I'm reading from Dr. So-and-so says I should do this. Well, you can trust Dr. So-and-so who's here today, gone tomorrow, who made 15 predictions throughout the pandemic and was wrong on every one of them. Yeah, but he's got doctor. Come on. It doesn't matter if he's wrong, he's a doctor. Or are you going to trust the creator of all things, the one who spoke the world into being? You're going to trust the one who is greater. He who is in us is greater than he who's in the world. Who are you going to trust? Because when you look through lenses of faith, you listen for his voice, and then you do what he says, even if it takes you against the grain of what the world is doing. In fact, understand, it generally will take you against the grain of what the world is doing. Almost every time. You just need to be prepared for that. You need to be prepared. By the way, you have lenses of faith. You need to be prepared for people looking at you going, why are you so weird? You listen to voices? I can't hear those voices. Are you listening for the voice of God? Well, no, but I can't hear them. That doesn't even make sense. And then you're doing things that are completely opposite. Why? Because God told me. This is what the word of God says. This is how I should raise my kids. This is how I should handle my money. This is how I should invest my time. This is how I should live my life. And it's completely different than the people around you. That's what lenses of faith do. And because of that, people who put their trust in him, when their faith is in him and not circumstances, they find that their joy is lasting. And it's not based on whatever the circumstance of the moment is. See, it's all about focus. When you look, what do you see? The trials are real, but so is he. If you really have faith, you believe that, and it changes how you respond. Listen to this. James said this. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. It's like, wait a minute, really? That doesn't make sense, James. Come on, I'm not some sort of masochist here. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Do you realize that's a statement of faith? And you have to decide if you believe it or not. The tri testing of your faith produces perseverance. Why? Because when I test my faith, when I, when I walk and I trust him, and I walk in faith in the midst of trial and persecution, 
or hardship or struggle or whatever it is, when I trust him, he always proves himself faithful. And now I just got a little more perseverance because I know he's real. I know he's there. And I trusted him and he took care of me. Count it all joy. Notice he doesn't say count it all happiness. He doesn't say count it pure happiness. I can be unhappy about a lot of circumstances, but my joy isn't attached to circumstances. That's the point. I can be very unhappy with circumstances. Stuff's happening, and I'm not happy with circumstances. But my joy isn't attached to those circumstances. My joy is in spite of the circumstances. My joy comes from a higher place. My joy is something that the Spirit of God is putting internally in me. And as such, this world can't touch it. See, when you're people of faith, you live with a confidence that is rooted in that faith, and that confidence allows you to live in joy. Freedom from fear is found in the good news of great joy, and his name is Jesus. Last thing. Fear gives way to joy when you practice gratitude for the goodness of God. Did you hear that? Fear gives way to joy when you practice gratitude for the goodness of God. Psalm 95, 1 and 2 says this. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. Did you notice in 1 Peter 1 that he began his message to these people? After his salutation, he begins with a prayer of gratitude and praise to people who were under persecution, who were exiles. Gratitude and praise. And, and here's the thing you've got to understand. Gratitude is like a daily infusion of joy. It's like a joy pill. Do you understand that? When I am grateful, it, it's hard to be great. grateful. I'm always joyful. When I'm grateful, I'm experiencing joy. This is so key. Some of you need to hear this right now. This is specifically for you. Because you're focused and you're, and you're looking at the things you don't have instead of stopping and saying, God, thank you for these things I do have. You're like, well, I don't have as much as somebody else. That's not the point. You have a lot. I'm saying, I don't care if you're thanking God for the electricity in your apartment. Thank you, God, that I have a car to get here to church. And you're like, yeah, you don't know how crappy my car is. Doesn't matter. You had a car. No, I had to ride the bus. Well, thank God you had the bus. Thank God we had a, we had a meal today. Thank God that we have what we have, our family, our friends. Literally begin, and what happens when you walk in gratitude, you can't help but begin to experience joy. And it's like you can take a joy pill every day. Start out your day by going, God, thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for my family. Thank you for freedom. And all of a sudden you find, ah, oh, the fear begins to give way because it's being replaced by joy. See, the love of God, trusting in him and gratitude are keys to the gift of joy. And they're also keys to that joy displacing fear. I want us to take some time and give thanks this morning. Because, man, I'm telling you, so many people are just overrun with fear. They completely miss out on the gift of joy that the Father has for them. It's like they look right past God's work around them. And, and it, it's the tragedy when people of God live like that. We're not called to live like that. We're called to be different. We're called to be people who see the world through the lens of good news, great joy. A Savior is Christ the Lord. He saved us. He's redeemed us. He's blessed us. Lord, give us your joy. We thank you. All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so 
so good with every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God. Sing that again. Give him thanks. All my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am in. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up, Till I lift my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Give him thanks. Let me hear you testify. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so. breath that I am in, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no one. Know you as a friend, and I have lived in the goodness of God. Sing it out, give it thanks. In all my life, you have been faithful. All my life, you have been so. Sing that again all my life, all my life. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am faithful, oh, I will sing of the good. Your goodness, come on, tell it. Your goodness is running out. It's running out today. Your goodness is running out. It's running out today. With my life laid down, I surrender. Jesus, let every 
good we worship you Lord thank you so much for your grace thank you for forgiveness thank you for life thank you for air that we breathe for the friends and family who are surrounded by Lord Jesus remind us that we are filled with your love let that change how we see our life and how we see the world let us love others with your love Remind us that you are faithful and we can trust you. We can trust you. We don't trust in circumstances. Circumstances can be great or circumstances can be not so great, but you're still present and you're good. You're greater. And Lord, the simple gift of gratitude, help us to be people who take time to give thanks and let that fill us with your joy. We love you. We thank you. Make us people of joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God is good.